Today we are going to talk about oscilloscope impedance, what we want from it and what to expect. In many oscilloscopes, non-automotive and automotive alike, the input characteristics are specified as 1 megohm with a small capacitance in parallel. The capacitance becomes important for high frequencies, but for DC, low and medium frequencies, the input resistance plays the dominant role. 1 megaohm is a good round number and it's appropriate for testing many circuits. And it's no surprise because typically you do not want to load the circuit under test. However, there are situations where you would be using input impedance different from 1 megaohm. And one situation is using certain types of attenuators. Not all of them though. If you are looking at an old Pico 20 to 1 attenuator or their Hunter cousins, they will still use 1 megaohm impedance. On the other hand, 10 to 1 attenuator from Pico, the newer one will have 8 megaohm. And so this type of attenuators can be used not only with high voltages, but also for certain high impedance sensors, such as NOx sensors. The situation changes when you are dealing with very high frequency signals. For example, notice the difference between these two four channel oscilloscopes. This one and this one. Well, we can see that in the first case the bandwidth is 100 MHz and in the second is 350 MHz. But that's not the only difference. You can also see that uh, all four channels of the first oscilloscope have one megaohm input impedance and two channels of the second oscilloscope are switchable between one megaohm and 50 ohm. What does that mean? Well, at very high frequencies your probes become a transmission line and thus your oscilloscope becomes part of the circuit and the impedance of the oscilloscope and the uh, properties of the probes or your transmission line have to be matched to the impedance of the source. And there is a white paper on ni.com that explains this perfectly with the diagrams where you have a source that has a 50 ohm output impedance that the signal is transmitted over the matched cable and it has to arrive into an oscilloscope and if you have a 50 ohm termination then everything will be good and the signal that you will see on the oscilloscope will match what the source is producing and if you are using one mega ohm bad things will happen the signals will start to reflect around and you will see a distorted picture. So this is the point of using a 50 ohm termination here. And also a friendly warning, if you got an oscilloscope like that, there, there might be a temptation to use 50 ohm mode as a load, uh, in a sense having some sort of a fancy built-in load pro right in your oscilloscope and well don't do that first of all there is a voltage limit typically 5 volts maximum and your probes are not designed for high currents that would uh, happen if you used it as a load pro so don't even try to do that if you need to load the circuit do it externally make some adapters so that you can connect both your oscilloscope and the test light or something like that. Now there is a class of devices that is popular in the do-it-yourself world and that's why I have to mention them. They are basically microcontrollers that are using the ADCs to sample the input signal directly without an input buffer. Because of that, the input impedance is fairly low and is measured in kiloohms rather than megaohms. Here is an example of such a device. 
here is the chip and through a simple circuitry it uh, samples the input signal. If you look at the schematic, this is basically it. The pin of the microcontroller is looking at the input signal through a 10 kilo ohm resistor. And thus there is no surprise that the input impedance is listed at 10 kilo ohm. I have no problem with such a device. It can be useful to check uh, low impedance output sources, but it's also claimed that it can be used for automotive work. And this is where things get confusing. There are tons of automotive circuits where an oscilloscope with input impedance of 10 kilo ohm will distort the signal or worse, will put your car into a limp mode and we are going to consider an example of just that. Let's consider the electric throttle, which consists of a motor and two potentiometers that are reporting the angle of the butterfly valve. If we are going to uh, test it on a bench, uh, that will look pretty much like this. So we have uh, energizing the motor and the potentiometers are reporting different voltage. At idle, TPS1 reports 1.32 volts. Uh, remember this value we will need it later on. The easiest way to understand what is happening is to use a circuit simulation. So let's do just that. We have a 5 volt battery uh, that is connected to a 5 kilo ohm potentiometer and we assume that the split in the resistance values right now is 1320 to 3680 and it's no coincidence these values are chosen because when I'm using a oscilloscope with 1 mega ohm input impedance we are going to simulate this circuit for a DC bias and we will get that the output here is 1.32 volts just like we had on the DMM. However, if you put a 10 kilo ohm resistor instead of a 1 mega ohm and repeat the simulation, we are going to get 1.2 volts, about 10% lower than we had before. Now let's see what the car computer sees. And I have a picture of uh, what happens during that uh, particular bench test. Uh, here we have it. So we have a blue trace that is our TPS1. And notice that it starts at 1.2 volts, while the TPS2 is starting from 3.7 volts. And we see already that the sum of those is not equal to 5 volts. Instead, it's equal to 4.9 volts. And things get even worse when we uh, command the throttle to open because then the sum of them reduced, gets reduced to 4.6 volts. And this is something that the car computer will notice easily and will say, okay, there's something wrong with uh, these angles. I cannot continue anymore like that. It will put the car into the limp mode. And uh, I don't know, if you're diagnosing some issues, you've made your life much, much harder at this point. And this is it for this topic. To summarize, most of the time you will be fine using a 1 mega ohm impedance. Sometimes you want to use higher impedance, for which you will use certain attenuators. If you need to load the circuit, do it outside of your oscilloscope using equipment such as test lights or something like that. If you are not doing radio frequency work, you are not likely to need the 50 ohm option. And be aware that devices that have lower input impedance uh, that is measured in kilo ohms 
may distort the signals too much. Hope this was fun and see you next time.